facilities here, which I knew a little bit, but I've learned a lot more since I've been here. So appreciate everyone. station and and added to more public domain assets Biodiversity is a little bit more research oriented, typically ecological forecasting is more applied focused and that's where most of my time is spent, but I do support, do support both. So I want to talk a little bit about what that program is all about, some of the current marine projects. That's my niche. There's three associate program managers that work for Woody Turner. Uh, I'm the marine guy. Uh, he also has two other associates, one that focuses on terrestrial and the other on freshwater systems and a combination of freshwater and terrestrial. Uh, talking to some of the students at lunch, I want to talk a little bit about you know, what I do, you know, what kind of job is this, what's the stuff I do, and hopefully give students an idea too of, uh, of maybe how they can engage through internships and opportunities to do that kind of work or to get more experience doing that kind of work down the road. Uh, and I, I'll talk a little bit about opportunities coming up in the next year, but I unfortunately don't have a lot of details on that that I can share today. Uh, so I worked with Ruth Carmichael, who's really the, who was my mentor and expert on horseshoe crab. She's at Dauphin Island Sea Lab and part of the Marine Science Department, uh, University of South Alabama. Uh, John Chen is up in North Alabama uh, near Huntsville, Alabama A&M, and he's an ecological modeler. And um, goes down there from different organizations with UAH. And this was principally funded, this work, by some institutional funds from, from the, the institutions noted there, as well as primarily Gulf oil spill money, which I know some of you down here got some of that, that money. Uh, yeah, talking a little bit about horseshoe crabs and some bats. They're actually not in the crab family, they're more in the spider family. There's four species of horseshoe crabs, and I'm gonna talk about the American horseshoe crab, which is a east coast of North America and part of the Caribbean. Uh, coast uh, down to the Yucatan roughly to Maine uh, area that these animals inhabit and there's three species in Asia you know the parts of the horseshoe crab basic parts are shown over here it has a telsum it ha has a carpus and really when we measure horseshoe crabs we measure about right here across the carpus so I'm going to show you some data and talk about the width it's a Two hundred forty-five million years. Surely, to goodness, we can learn something from an animal that's been around two hundred forty-five million years. That's a long time. So, uh, <laughs> no beeper. Um, they uh, can, can make them maddening to study because it's kind of hard to pin down what some of the drive are as to why they do certain things or which habitats they seem to prefer. We do know from telemetry data and all that they tend to dwell in estuaries. So they tend to stay in estuarine areas, but they can go out in the open ocean and move around the shelf, and that's part of their, their adaptive uh, characteristics. So, uh-oh, wrong button. The ecological niche, they very uh, Some of you may know that there's an, it's called an LAL test, amoeba site. Um, The test is for endotoxins, pharmaceutical products, and their blood. Their blood. 
constituent that we have, we can identify these endotoxins. So they're very important in that respect. Historic uh, bait and uh, uh, fertilizer. And At least in the northern Gulf, they tend to. Never before have they So when you start to have debris like that, you data set for meteorological variables and funding is typically not readily available or hasn't been but because of this oil spill at least that was one positive thing that came from it I suppose so our hypothesis was that habitat suitability would increase to the west from as we got further away from this freshwater discharge okay uh, so what we, what we want to establish a data set that's the first objective we want to learn about the demographics learn what we could about the relative abundance population structure, knowing this is an area that 
hadn't been studied much, and knowing that probably data was sparse, we decided, well, let's get everything we can. So let's get the, the dead ones, the live ones, we're going to check them out, and they do mold up to sexual maturity. So exoskeleton remotes, let's collect it all, let's measure it all, let's evaluate all of it together. Okay? Um, so let me press on. Okay, so study area and methods. This Mobile Bay, this is Fort Morgan Peninsula. That would be this site here. These are transects, the T123. They're about two kilometers each here, shorter here. These were control sites on the seaward side that we surveyed. So this is Dauphin Island. This is a mixture of private and public land. Part of it's Bond Secure Oyster Refuge Conservation Area. Part of it's private. Dauphin Island, Alabama is 100% private. It refused to be part of the Gulf Islands National Seashore years ago when the opportunity presented itself. Uh, and Katrina cut it right here, 2005. This is Petty Boy Island, Mississippi, and Horn, and Horn Island, Mississippi, here. So we did two, two surveys, two different years, uh, about 10 surveys here, and a, and a smaller number here, just four over this period of time on these transects in these areas. So I had four sites, and we did the analysis by site, not by transect. <coughs> okay, what are we looking for? Well, first, we surveyed on the full and new moons within plus or minus two hours, ideally, of high tide, because we know the animals tend to, to, to move in and out on the tides. We collected these data. For these animals, we measured those we could, and the extent we could, depending on the condition of the uh, carcass or moat, uh, we tried to determine sex. Uh, in the field, uh, on a Boston whaler near shore, we actually got water temperature in the benthic layer, Secchi disk for water clarity, and with the Y side, we also got salinity and dissolved oxygen data. The remote and sense data set, we got information on precipitation amount, wind speed, and wind direction. Wind direction pretty important as well as wind speed because wave energy tends to cause these animals not to want to encounter or, or try to access the shoreline. So we did some geospatial analysis here with the uh, ArcGIS, did some statistical analysis with uh, SPSS uh, in terms of the tools that we used along with Excel. So, this is basically measuring for some width here with a couple of, uh, of animals that were uh, in amplexus or paired, uh, that, were, that were mating. Uh, here's a Wasi that Kara's actually using. She helped out one survey here. And this is another student that actually is marking uh, a sample so that we don't double count it when we come back and look at that area next time. Okay, one of the questions that came up, we first talked about talking about using moats. Well, what the heck? A moat? How do you know if you find that moat here where Frank's setting, that that moat didn't that it originated there, that the animal moated there, or maybe it moated way over there in the shipyard somewhere? You don't really know. We're doing GPS coordinates, so what about moat transport? You know, most of the currents here are tidal currents in these islands. There is a longshore current that predominantly goes from east to west. So, we actually did a moat experiment with a student. So we put moats out two meters and 200 meters from shore, and then we came back and checked where we released them, or in the general area where we released them, and tried to find them over a 30-day period. All right, typically you don't find but about 5% or so, like a mark recapture sort of study, and that, that's about what we got. We got a little less than 5% total that we recovered. The more interesting thing for us is that those that were released near shore, which, uh, for juvenile animals especially, they're probably going to be near shore as opposed to further out in the surf. Uh, they were typically found within about a thousand meters or a kilometer of where they were released or less. We did find one that was released 200 meters offshore and it was found after almost a month and it still was within about a kilometer of the release site. So take home message here, given the size of our sites, these barrier islands, any barrier island where we found a moat, we legitimately could say, well, that moat happened associated with that site. So we felt good about that. So a little bit of data. Live is the light, moats are the gray, carcasses are the, the black, the, the darkest. All right, sites from the east to the west, remember that was a hypothesis, Fort Morgan, Petty Boy, or Dolphin, excuse me, Petty Boy, and Horn. So you can see we collected more data on the western islands. Surprisingly, we found live animals on Fort Morgan Peninsula. 
when we started doing this, my colleague, who was the, really the expert on horseshoe crabs, Dr. Cormack, said there won't be any horseshoe crabs in Mobile Bay. First day we went out, there were live animals in Mobile Bay. Uh, these animals are very hard to predict. They, they, are, they will surprise you. Uh, weather conditions, environmental conditions, were radically different between 2012 and 2013. We had a lot more storms, we had, we had heavier surf, we had more wind from the east, which was bad because that generated more tidal energy. Uh, it didn't, these barrier islands didn't shelter the shorelines on the lee side of the island because of the north and east winds. As a result, we found out of 52 live animals, we found all but one in 2012. The one live animal we found, you can't see it. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> that was the one we found, and we found it in the most unlikely place over in Fort Morgan Peninsula again. Uh, what we did find, though, was an enormous number of primarily juvenile moats, over 400 on Petty Boy Island primarily. And we found some carcasses and some of the others. So we never found any moats or live animals on Dolphin Island. In years before, anecdotally, I had been out there and I actually collected <coughs> specimens for the estuarium, the Education Outreach Center, and we went to Dolphin Island after Katrina had cut the island. Of course, you crabs were everywhere. Since the cut has been filled up, and the times we've been able to survey, we're not finding any horseshoe crabs on Dolphin Island. Don't know, don't know what the connection may be. Uh, temporal change in occurrence. So really, this is another way to look at some of the same data. You're looking basically at light shaded to dark shaded east to west, and these were the survey dates in each of the years. So you see a pretty obvious east to west trend in the number of data. You see spring peaks. Well, we're finding the most data. Of course, these are all those moats in the second year, as well as the westward slant. Okay, one of the things that, that we were pleased we were able to do with all the data, using the moats, the carcasses, and the carcasses, we were able to produce what we think are pretty reasonable possible growth cohorts. I mean, these are those moats. These are the young guys, the juveniles growing. Another one here, another one here. And the grand, grandpa and grandmas are over there. So. That was pretty exciting that we were able to do that, and this matched other literature looking at growth cohorts. I mean, if you think a horseshoe crab has about a 10-year cycle to maturity, on the average, if you're starting out here with zero, you're going to have about a 20 uh, millimeter persona width growth over 10 years on the average. But they molt more frequently, the rate of growth is faster when they're younger than when they start to get more and more mature. But anyway. Okay. So that's kind of the population demographics part. So let's start talking about the physical environment and how that's associated with where we were finding the data that we found. Okay? This is a CCAP land cover land use class. It's a Landsat derived. You're probably familiar with NOAA CCAP data, some of you. Anyway, it's a 30 meter native data set. But 30 meters was too much of a checkerboard for what we were doing. So what we did is resample to 300 meters, and that's what this is for each of our sites which gave us a pattern that we thought more fairly we could try and associate with these points where we're finding all the data, which we basically had a GPS point where we're finding every piece of data. And so what we found was that uh, two classes, estuarine emergent wetland and bare land, associated with most of our data, and typically bare land was more associated with live animals, well, a little bit more. The new estuary. So, what are the characteristics of those data sets? Well, bare land is just sandy beach, basically. Okay, very little vegetative cover. Whereas the estuary emergent wetland, you got some tidal wetlands, and about 80% vegetative cover. Most of it grass, about yay high, you know, very low grass areas. So, this, these seem to be the areas the animals preferred, and it's well known that a sandy beach uh, is a preferred habitat for spawning. All right, we did a little. Uh, General linear, general linear modeling, and we looked at the different categories of data we collected versus land cover, land use, and site discreetly and together. Really live animals is what's interesting here. And we found the models to be significant, both looking at land cover, land use discreetly as well as adding site to it. But land cover, land use actually was a significant variable, a more, a more important variable than site when they were put together. So that further I think added some validity to what we thought was the uh, land cover land use type linkage in the data that we were finding. 
So we, uh, we look back and, and, and at the sites and say, well, okay, how much of this land is actually on the site? How much of this, these type classes exist uh, on these sites we surveyed? And well, not surprisingly, I guess, you find out that the sites where we found the most data is where we have the most land of this type. The animals are preferring that type of shoreline habitat. So now what do we do with that? Well, we got this other data, so we think we've got some land cover land use linkage. So we wanted to look at these other variables, the in situ data we collected about the water, uh, the, the, the seawater in the area where the animals are, are, are swimming to get to the islands, and also some of the meteorological data. So we did some univariate regression, and we used that along with literature values to come up with uh, different relationships, uh, response curves is, is the univariate regression. I'll show an example in just a minute. And the literature values, and we came up with this idea, well, what if we, we said a habitat suitability index would be basically this first ratio that we've developed, the total land cover land use and the, and the suitable amount, what I showed in the last slide. And then we come up here and we look at the total days we surveyed and looked at these various variables with thresholds and found how many days was it suitable to win that threshold and how many not suitable. And we came up with another proportion and kind of see what that, what that looked like. So here's an example of one looking at the, co the combined data of live animals and molts. Uh, it's salinity parts per thousand. Uh, and you can see the relationship here. It's relatively strong. Uh, it's nonlinear, though it's relatively close to linear. Uh, a little bit better relationship with a polynomial. Uh, literature values, dissolved oxygen, less than five milligrams per liter. We didn't, didn't find any animals in that kind of situation that's based in the literature. Salinity, at least in where we were looking, uh, we didn't find anything less than 20, uh, any data uh, for live animals or moles. Water clarity, about less than 0.7 meters. Wind direction, uh, forget the degrees, it, it needed to be from the south or west, if it was east or north, not good. Uh, wind speed, if it got over eight meters per second, it tended to be too, a little bit too rough to, for the animals to want to uh, go to the shoreline. And precipitation basically was a, a proxy for stormy conditions and <coughs> cloud cover. So if it was raining, we considered that uh, not suitable. And we didn't use water temperature. So when we did the, I'm sorry, I didn't tell the calculation. So basically for this particular example for the whole domain, uh, you would have a total of 282 days, that many were suitable, so you had a 0 0.80 suitability proportion or suitability ratio with number if you want. So yeah, you multiply those two together. And again, we see the western sites are more suitable, which we expected, but th this really, I think, is somewhat on target with what I think is real here. Even though we found live animals on Fort Rungan Peninsula, there's nothing suitable about that area. We found no molds. I really don't think that's an area that animals are trying to reproduce. They just happen to be there, I think, the day we happen to look. So I think that's right. And Dauphin Island, I think, even though we didn't find really any live animals or molds, I think it probably is more suitable than, than Petty Boy. And certainly these two areas with Petty Boy being the most suitable. Petty Boy Island is almost exactly equidistant between the, the Mobile Bay Discharge and the Mississippi River Discharge. And one of the obvious characteristics is that the most clear water most often is in that area. The other thing that's unique to Petty Boy Island is it's a half moon curvature, which does a great job deflecting any of the wind energy from the south or the west, even better than the other islands do because of that curvature. So I think that may be one reason, or reasons the animals prefer Petty Boy Island. So I probably said a lot of this already, uh, spatially anyway, I think I made that comment. <coughs> the classes, um, you know, I, I really think in these areas that, that uh, don't have large populations and, and data is hard to find that, that collecting these types of data for what we call a lifetime data set is, a, is, is really a good approach. Uh, the HSI needs more work, I think, to be published. Part of this has been published, that has not. Uh, and we want to make it a little more robust and test it in some other, other areas. but. It gives us a chance to have a quantifiable tool, I think, which could be really useful not only in this area, but other places to evaluate habitat. A lot of people helped me. Uh, Gulf Islands National Seashore gave us permits to do sampling on uh, Pettyboy and Horn Islands, for example, uh, funding. 
whole bunch of volunteers as well as various summer students that are shown here. So how far are we doing here? About 30 minutes. All right, let's talk. I mean, pause. I guess we'll have questions at the end. I'll pause if you don't have a burning question. Let me change gears and let's talk about a little water quality modeling work that I'm doing with USGS, the lead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, NASA's funding, and as I mentioned, uh, USRA is a nonprofit. It's a partner. And also the University of Wisconsin is providing really some data to USGS on uh, a PRISM data, I believe. Uh, the two of us' primary function in this project, you can read the objectives so forth there, are to provide new remotely sensed data sets that can be tested in the SPARA water quality model. So that's what we worked on. I'll show you the kind of data sets that we produced at UAH in particular will be my focus, which I think are somewhat unique. So what we want to do is in this domain, the southeast, this model produces output at the reach level. There's 324,000 and a few reaches in the southeast domain. So it's a whole bunch of data. The calibration stations are the triangles here, all right? In the coastal watersheds that we're attempting to do special dynamic models are Tampa, Sarasota, Weeks Bay, Mobile, and Winya Bay over here in the Carolinas. I'm going to mainly focus on uh, the Tampa Bay down here to the extent I can. So we're trying to improve these models. Now what I mean by dynamic, these models have been developed with annual data sets typically. What we are doing with all the variables that we're providing is we're giving them seasonal data, seasonal means. So they're dynamic in the extent there's four data points showing changes due to seasonality throughout the year. So we think that's a pretty big step forward. We're developing models for nitrogen, phosphorus, and suspended sediment. Nitrogen, phosphorus, much more important to Tampa Bay than suspended sediment. Suspended sediment's way more important to Mobile Bay the nitrogen phosphorus for each of the end users and areas have needs that, that vary and we're listening to that. Uh, we're working to provide some, I did it again, to provide some data that we can apply to a tool we're developing for end users uh, that will have the capability to do scenarios looking at future land cover land use change and climate changes and I'll say a little more about that. Again, it's applied science, so it's got to have a decision component to it. This is SPARA, uh, spatially referenced regressions on watershed attributes. I'm working on the project three years, and I still can't remember what the acronym is half the time. <laughs> so I had to put it up there so I could remind myself <laughs> what it means. Uh, uh, these would be the, the typical sources for nitrogen in particular and phosphorus. Uh, cultivated land, also fertilizers, for example, urban runoff, uh, point discharges from wastewater treatment plants. All the others would be non-point. <laughs> Here, pasture runoff, manure uh, is one of the uh, data sets that is uh, provided. And the model gives you uh, predictions on nutrient fluxes, concentrations, and yields in these streams, these 324,000 reaches. So here's some of the remote sensing data that, uh, that uh, I've worked with along with colleagues at UAH and uh, USRA, the nonprofit that mentioned. USRA is primarily doing land imaging sensor data here, they're working on that stuff. Land cover land use in OCD is standard in the model. We have been working on or and, ha and have produced a seasonal EVI from 2001 to the present that has turned out to be beneficial to the modeler. It's a significant variable. And we also were challenged to do a couple of things that were a little bit unique, like what about disturbance? Is there any kind of variable we could develop to help us capture disturbance, like logging or just cultivating crops, things like that? And how about surface water? You know, if you have surface water, that affects runoff. That affects the land water delivery system from nutrients. So we worked on that. Um, okay, so we did EVI, and we did a surface water index using Landsat data. I'm not going to go into the details of that in the interest of time. The land disturbance index uh, was developed by uh, uh, Ashraf al Hamdan, who's a colleague at UAH uh, over in civil engineering. And of course, he had to do a flow chart. Really, it's pretty simple here, what you've got is you've got the forest mean EVI at a baseline in 2001, for example, when we started, and you got a certain change in the next year divided by the baseline. That's basically your forest disturbance index for a given season. And the seasons, the way USGS wanted to define them, are not meteorologically accurate. They wanted to do January through March, et cetera, through the end of the year, and that's not what meteorologists would have chosen as time periods for seasons, but that's what it's based on. So what this tells us, very simply, is that 
you have reforestation in some areas that are green. If they're close to, to zero, you've got little or no change. And if you're getting into the purples and <coughs> reds, you've got disturbance. You've got logging going on. You've got activity that's potentially affecting the nitrogen, phosphorus, and the nutrients that are being delivered in the system. And I already mentioned the dynamic models over on the right, so let me move on. So just looking at Tampa, and this is still working properly. I know this is hard to read. You got an R square of 80, uh, 0 0.87, which is not bad. Uh, the EVI variable was, was very significant in this particular model. It's not the same significance in other watersheds and other models. And this is looking at total of nitrogen flux in kilograms per year over here from 2001 to 20, actually just through 2010, looks like. Uh, and you can see we're doing a pretty good job of capturing the patterns where the uh, blue line is the predicted load and the uh, red line is the monitored load. So we're over predicting a little bit would be, would be the biggest problem, it appears there. But it's not bad. So it's a pretty good model and hopefully it's going to be good enough that decision makers over at the Tampa Bay Estuary Program and Sarasota Bay will find it useful. Uh, so USGS is working on developing our shiny mapper interface. I know some of you use R here, I'm sure. One of the things they want to do is have scenarios where you could do some sort of reduction in sources and he's, see how that would affect total nitrogen. The graphic map happens to be for the Winya Bay uh, project, not Tampa, but it's illustrative. And we're also working, we've worked with USGS and um, to develop uh, with our they have developed, but we've actually used it to develop a land cover land use data set with them that provides information from 1940 through 2100. And here's the different classes in that data set. We talked to the end users and said, look, in thinking in terms of climate scenarios, if these are the ch among the, the choices, which ones do you want us to model or have in your tool? And they picked an A2 pro economy one as kind of a worst case and they picked the B2 pro-environment as the best case. That's what they chose. So that's what we're going to use. This indicates uh, the black, I know it's hard to see, <laughs> is the uh, baseline, or, or historical, excuse me, and the uh, orange and reds would be kind of worst case or pro-economy pro scenarios, and the greens and uh, yellows there would be the pro-environment or best case scenario. So uh, you can kind of see how things change over time depending on which data set you're talking about or which scenario. We point out this over here, because this illustrates this idea of seasonal data and the dynamic feature of these models. All right, this is looking at climate, temperature and precipitation data. Uh, for example, from summer 2019 to spring of 2020, you see the four data points. All right, we're also looking, again, this is Winya Bay, not Tampa, and we're looking at total phosphorus, not nitrogen, being the black line. Well, obviously, precipitation is the driver. It'll more than likely be the important driver for nitrogen and sediment and everything else compared to temperature, I would assume. So you can see the pattern, uh, how they match in temperatures relatively. Uh, relatively unimportant, but uh, I don't think totally unimportant in the grander scheme of things. Okay, so I mentioned problems in coastal areas. Uh, Becca Russell, a grad student near System Science Program at UAH, did this work with me. Uh, she looked at 54 stations in Tampa, let me show you, because we're, we're not really happy with the overall performance of that model and we think, think in tidal fluxes, coastal stations were the part of the problem. Um, the uh, black numbers, if you can see them, indicate the stations, the 54 stations, and the coding over here is kind of the bigger the dot the circle gets, or the symbol, the worse the error, and all the way to 100% 100 error or more here in a couple of stations here, uh, the smallest is zero to 25 percent. Well, close to zero is not bad, but 25 percent even is not so good, and you have a number of those there. So you see, if, if we look just at this area, the observed nitrogen versus the predicted uh, nitrogen is relatively poor with an R-square of about 14 or 0.14. Uh, Nash Sutcliffe efficiency is just another stat like a R-square. Uh, Nash Sutcliffe, if it's zero, your model is as good as the mean. If it's less than zero, your model is worse than the mean. It, the better it gets above zero, the better your model. And if it gets to one, it's a perfect model. If nobody gets to one. Okay? <laughs> as you can see, we're barely <laughs> over zero there with the Nash Sutcliffe. <laughs> not too good. We're a little bit better than the mean, which that's not so encouraging. And here's just some descriptive stats. Uh, 
For the overall model in the southeast, though, it's not bad. You know, we're 0 0.42, and the R square is about 0 0.46. So the overall southeast model for nitrogen is pretty good, but we're having trouble in some of these coastal areas because of the predominance, I think, of stations. And we may just have, you know, if we take the stations out where we have tidal influence, we'll get a lot better number, but we're trying to make sure we don't take out anything we shouldn't at this point and make sure that we're making the right assumption. Okay. So let me wrap up here with some talk about NASA Applied Sciences program. Um, how many of you are familiar with the NASA Applied Sciences program? Can I ask that question? Can I ask the question, Kara, before the question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. How many of you are familiar with the NASA Applied Sciences program? A few timid hands. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, the NASA Earth Science Division deals with flight systems, you know, research, you know, satellites, basic research, education. I talked to some of the students about some of the education programs at lunch uh, within Earth Science. NASA Develop is a real uh, strong education program. Applications, which I want to focus on, and technology. There is a technology component, developing new satellites, design, working now with end users to actually inform the next satellite so that people like the estuary programs and others that aren't research scientists actually have some input in getting data they think they need to make decisions. So kind of a cool idea maybe. So the Applied Sciences program, Practical Applications Earth Science. Um, publications are great. We love publications in Applied Sciences, but that's not the ultimate goal. Informing decision making with Earth's observations is the ultimate goal. So we want to take application ideas and have sustained use. If we have a project that's three or four years and when the project ends, Everything stops. Well, that was a nice idea, but there's not, you know, the value is pretty limited to that. Then really the folks that we thought were going to benefit from what we produced, if they don't care enough about it to keep it going after the project, then you got to wonder, was it really worth the investment? Right. Uh, so we're interested in enhancing capabilities, doing a kind of capacity building. I mentioned the mission, mission planning. We've got somebody now for the Center for Disease Control this own mission planning working groups for the next air quality and health satellite sensor. It's a good idea, I think. Why not? Why shouldn't they have some input? What's the key measure of success? Transition of products to, that probably should be four, to sustained use by the partner organization. That's really what we want. We love the publications and we brag about them too, but that's really the ultimate goal. There's four core areas. Of course, I'm here representing ecological forecasting. Woody Turner is program manager. Some of you know Woody, fantastic person, really great guy that leads that program as good as anybody could, I think. Water resources, Brad Dorn is program manager, health and air quality, John Haynes, and disasters is David Green. Now, these are the core thematic areas. All these areas over on the right and more, certainly ocean including, cross cut across all these areas again. I just told you I focus on marine projects and applied sciences, and I'll tell you more about that. So obviously oceans and marine is important. Current marine projects, these are currently funded projects. I've been working for Woody since 2012, February 2012. So I've done a whole bunch of projects, okay? These are the current ones. One of the great things about this job, as you can see from this list, while I'm not able to do the research, I couldn't possibly do all this kind of research. Nobody would be smart enough to do that, except maybe Frank, but I mean, nobody could do that, right? <laughs> Uh, Sargassum, in the back of the room here, uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Who, doing a great job. Coral reef disease, uh, Megan Donahue, Hawaii. Uh, coral reef disease is, I think, somewhat of an emerging issue. Uh, certainly, con conserving coral reefs has been an issue a long time. Habs, um, and this actually is Habs. We got Habs here, we got Habs off the California coast. We got Habs in the Middle East. This is in Oman. Um, Atlantic Sturgeon, Matt Oliver, a great project, a fishery oriented project. Ecosystem Services, we talked a little bit about economics at lunch. You know, if you're interested in applications, depending on what you're doing, it might make a lot of sense to talk to a research, resource economics. It might, might be very useful. Uh, capital Accounting, Seascapes, a lot of you know Maria probably, Oregon State, some really cool, innovative stuff. Ecosystem, or ecological functional types in the Arctic, uh, Howard Epstein. Uh, and these are, these are the older projects. These are like uh, two years old. These are like three years old. And these are just starting. They're a year or less. So let me step through real quick. 
This is a fisheries project, Atlantic Sturgeon project. We actually did some social media, NASA Communications did, uh, about this project with Matt Oliver. This is Delaware Bay, and he's developing a risk assessment system. Working with fishermen. Fishermen told him, he started working with them. He was giving them an image every day. They said, stop. No, do not hit me with something every day. Every three or four days is fine. <laughs> so listen to them. So about every three to five days, he produces a forecast. All right, and they like it, and they can hopefully not have as many harmful encounters with their fishing nets and otherwise with these very big fish. Uh, ecosystem services, as part of a project where they had workshops and actually uh, met some of the, the folks here, uh, Digna for one, I went to workshop in Sarasota. I attended the one in uh, in Mobile and uh, Grand Bay National uh, Estuarine Research Reserve, Mississippi. I did not go to the one in Louisiana or Galveston. Very long report, very good job. The point being, what are people doing? How are people estimating ecosystem services in these coastal, this very important coastal area? Are they or how are they using Earth observations to help them do that? This is kind of the core idea. Well, it turned out that nobody knows how to do ecosystem services. That's the main message that we got. Nobody knows how to do it. The other main message, everybody wants to do it, but nobody knows how. So, and again, what the majority of folks were saying is tell us how to do it. We need methods. Give us the methods. Well, one method won't fit all here, okay? Getting the data. Well, that was important, but not so important. I mean, folks were generally aware of Earth observations. They didn't always have the know-how in-house or the capability to process it, do something with it. And, and then knowing what to do with it, even if they had it, was something else. So that was somewhat eye-opening. And, you know, this is, this is the sort of thing that a decision will be made at, at uh, program manager level. Is this something we pursue further with a solicitation? And we try to help this. I mean, that's one reason you do workshop projects like this. Uh, coral disease in uh, Hawaii, uh, Megan and team is looking at sites all around the Pacific in the uh, northwestern islands to Guam, uh, Marianas Trench area, Samoa and Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and they're attempting to use a finer resolution sea surface temperature than Coral Reef Watch, which has typically been 50 kilometers. And they're also looking at coastal water quality indicators because most of these reef areas are pretty near the coast. Uh, this is the uh, Habs work in Oman. You can see the just huge fishery kills there. Uh, they're doing a, um, uh, the biogeochemical model, uh, NCOM cosine biogeochemical model. They're using remote sensing data to feed that. They're doing some laboratory cultures to look at growth rates of the Noctiluca bacteria, which is the problem here. But they have catastrophic blooms that just destroy the fishery. And um, Dr. Goes is working with the Fishery and Environmental Ministries in Oman. So we have a very good end user support, and they're putting a lot of money matching into the project. Uh, our own in the back here, showman, uh, is doing some great work. Uh, recently had a top 50, I think, science publication, if I've got that right, and uh, is doing work expanding the uh, Sargassum forecast system. Oh, sorry from this Caribbean area all the way over to Western Africa. Uh, it's migrating from MODIS to VIRS. You know, we, the news media talks a lot about failures NASA has when a satellite crashes or something doesn't launch, but nobody talks much about MODIS being 15 years beyond design life and still working great and millions of people using it, right? That's a huge success, but still, it's way past design life and VIRS is intended to replace it. And in this particular project, they have migrated over to VIRS successfully. Uh, they're also doing now weekly forecasts or more short-term forecasts in addition to the one or two month forecast, all of which is helping a variety of end users from the airlines to tourism industry. So a really great project right here at, at USF. Uh, Seascapes, um, Maria's focused on actually doing some validation work in the, uh, up in the Chukchi Sea uh, in the Arctic. That's a project she's working on. In this particular project, the project I just mentioned had a large-scale conservation emphasis. You may have noticed on the slide. This project has a geobond focus. So the last couple of solicitations have had an international focus. Woody wanted the project to actually link to geobond and support the goals of geobond. And so Maria's project, she's working with the Arctic bond, for example, on this project. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects, and I hope I get to go to Palau. We'll see. Uh, 
uh, Robert uh, Jones at the Nature Conservancy. This is an area that has been a traditional fishing economy. The fishery is collapsing from overfishing, other stressors. They're importing a lot more food, spam, and stuff like that. The population is getting sicker. It's, it's, it's a, sad, a sad trajectory. And so what the Nature, Converse, uh, Nature Conservancy is trying to do, and with remote sensing data and with the end users the government of Palau and various agencies are very supportive, is that they're working together to try to de develop a kind of really habitat suitability model to inform coastal aquaculture siting. They have three or four uh, uh, species that have historically been robust in the area and they're trying to find aquaculture sites that would be suitable to initiate aquaculture to try to help them start to rebuild their fishing economy to some extent. So I hope that works. It's very early first year. It's an A.8 which means all the rest of the projects they have to support sustainable development goals and it will be 14 or 15 whether it's terrestrial or water okay and they have to actually show that they're reporting up through to the UN for those goals which is a whole nother bureaucratic challenge in itself for the PIs and for me to figure out if they're doing it. Uh, finally I think uh, Benin and uh, Ghana they're using remote sensing data and working with end users to try to identify illegal gold mining activity which is happening here over a number of years they also have problems with mangoes and water uh, hyacinth invasive species and they're trying to use remote sensing data to uh, develop to monitor that better and figure out an approach to do that so it's real big on developing some good methods and tools to help with better monitoring of these problems in uh, West Africa okay uh, Oh, I'm going along, aren't I? Get done, right? Okay, <laughs> associate responsibilities. This is what I do. I get to, you know, if you students want to grade your faculty, well, I get to grade them right here. Okay, <laughs> I, guess, I guess you give them a report card. Uh, they have something called an applied readiness level that uh, we track the, the progress of the projects. Usually they start out down here and we hope they get up here, which would be sustained use after the project. So we look at milestones reports, uh, conference sessions. We have several sessions at Ocean Sciences that, uh, that uh, myself and Frank are involved in leading. So let me close with that. I hope uh, you appreciate Horseshoe Crabs a little bit more than you did when I started talking, if you didn't. Uh, I hope you're interested in water quality modeling. You'll check out some of these resources that might help you. And uh, there will probably be another call for ecological forecasting in Roses 2020. I can't say that for sure. I would say two out of three or three out of four years there's a solicitation there for some or all of the applied science thematic areas that usually comes out in February. So by mid-February something, start looking for ROSES, ROSES Research Opportunity in Space and Earth Sciences and see what you can find, okay? Thank you.